Hello and welcome to our discussion. In August, the FDA issued much anticipated guidance on wireless medical devices. As we all know, incorporating wireless technology into medical devices has many benefits that can impact patient outcomes, including increased patient mobility and remote access to real-time patient data. Dave, let's start by talking about the benefits, the clinical benefits of having a ubiquitous wireless LAN throughout the hospital. Could you paint us the picture of this hospital of the future? Thanks, Kathy. Um, back, if we're talking traditional patient monitoring, we're actually talking telemetry. Back in the 70s and 80s and through the 90s, traditionally, that was pretty much confined to the step-down area of the hospital. Um, a lot of facilities, depending upon the size of the facilities, had anywhere from 40 to upwards of maybe 120 different patient channels. Um, what's actually happened now and is of benefit both financially and clinically is to look at the hospital as trying to have that complete monitored facility. That means every square inch of that facility being monitored. Um, that has some benefits, as I mentioned. Um, some of those benefits include that in certain times of the season, such as, say, the winter when you have high flu seasons, there's a lack of being able to have monitored beds. And at times, many ERs have had to divert their patients to other facilities. In addition, the ICU is a traditionally a high cost area, so it's ideal to get those patients out and mobile as soon as you can. The patients also traditionally uh, also need to go down to the CT or radiology area, so it's nice to monitor those patients also there. And also there's a trend to where patients come in that were prior cardiac maybe come in for orthopedic procedures, and there's less of a, um, now just say less of a risk, but it's nice to have that orthopedic nurse know that somebody's monitoring that patient that possibly had a pacemaker before. So all that leads to the idea is that being able to have the facility capable of monitoring that patient anywhere that patient goes or travels really lends to having more flexibility in monitoring your facility it also possibly uh, increases revenue because you have less ER diversions. And you also can get the patients out and mobile soon, sooner and better so you can get, get them out of the high cost uh, ICU or high acuity areas. It's a lot of benefits. Yes. Great. But obviously the success of a wireless medical device is dependent on the networks upon which they run. Could you talk about what it takes to build a reliable network both from the WMTS standpoint and the Wi-Fi standpoint? Yeah, yes I can, thanks Kathy. Um, you know, essentially if you're looking at both WMTS and both wireless LAN, they're both an RF medium, meaning they are both what we consider to be wireless. If you look at WMTS, that's based upon uh, previous VHF, UHF, but coaxial based antenna systems that have been around for you know, approximately you know, 20, 25, 30 years. Nothing has really changed since that, since that point in time. So in the design of a system such as WMTS, it's a diversity antenna system. It requires two different antenna systems. It requires planning out a cable plan on each floor with specific lengths of coaxial cable. Per antenna, as I mentioned, diversity. Also powering each leg and then bringing those individual floors back and balancing out the entire system. A lot of that's kind of an art. A lot of that's um, dependent upon how well that you know, that person has experienced designing those systems. And then it's always dependent upon different environmental factors too. It depends upon the uh, construction materials of the facility, whether you need to add additional antenna systems here or there. And, you know, at the very end, you have to sit there with the spectrum analyzer really balance things out. You contrast that with the wireless LAN, um, which has crossed multiple vertical markets, un unlike, say, UHF and VHF and WMTS, which is niche to the medical device space. There are enterprise tools, software tools, that allow you to actually plan out the building or design of the wireless LAN using predictive modeling that takes into account to all the different building materials. And then by using di different tools, walk-around tools, you can actually plan where there's access points are. You now have controllers that actually control the power automatically that, depending upon that predictive model, can actually give you about a 98% accuracy before you go live. And then, as I mentioned, those tools, both software-based and both enterprise-based from the controller-based side, 
they're not only used in healthcare, but they're used in different vertical markets such as Department of Defense, Education, Hospitality, and also it's deployed across hundreds of thousands of different wireless LANs. So you're really taking advantage in the wireless LAN space of all that R&D, thousands and tens of thousands of deployments versus WMTS, which is very niche to the, the, the medical or healthcare space. Can you talk about the reliability of Wi-Fi for patient monitoring? Um, I think one of the concerns um, that has come up in terms of uh, discussions has been how reliable can wireless LANs be for a life critical application. And a lot of this really, there's dependencies upon the design of the network. But in reality, uh, wireless LAN or patient monitoring takes up a very small amount of bandwidth. And as I mentioned, in, other, in all these other vertical markets, we have a variety of different mediums such as voice, data, and video being used over the wireless LAN. And now we have instances of, say, real-time patient monitoring. While I agree that the critical, criticality of having live critical alarms and data needs to be there, there are ways to set up quality of service mechanisms in the controllers and set up priority queues that can allocate that correct amount of bandwidth and take precedence over, over other applications. This is standard best of practices. It's used in, the in multiple industries. It's used in industries such as you know, the financial transactions, where those financial transactions needs to, needs to get through. And essentially, it's network 101. The reality is, as I mentioned, patient monitoring, whether one monitor or 100 or 1,000 monitors, with the right quality of service mechanisms set up in the controllers, and, being, and, I, and additionally, this can be monitored as well because you, as other traffic comes through, it can always you know, say in a controller that patient monitoring has the highest QoS, and no matter what happens, that data will always get through. So no matter how narrow that is compared to the large bandwidth that video would take, the little car of patient monitoring gets through as opposed to the big bus of video. It always that, gets that, through. That's correct. And I think in con you also got to compare and contrast that also. So you have a network side and then you have an RF side because there's concern about, well, wireless LAN uh, can drop out the bad signal coverage. But if you go back to the previous question, if you design the, the in, and take into account the environment, use predictive tools, you can actually come out with about a 98% accuracy and then additionally, there's real-time spectrum analyzers that are now built into the access points, which you don't have that into you know, WMTS. I mean, that's not real-time. So in case of any type of potential interference that would come, it would know that, it would mitigate that and log that. And additionally, there's called SNMP monitoring, which can monitor that network in a live fashion. So the IT person would know proactively the health and characteristics of that network before actually something ever happened. Unlike something, you know, say in the, the previous UHF, VHF, WMTS world, the only way you're going to know that something happens when it, is when it actually happens. What's, um, what sort of thing could happen in a WMTS network that might cause interference? Um, you know, there's a variety of factors. Again, it's RF, just like the wireless LAN, uh, any th there's interference in the air. But in the case of WMTS, um, I've seen instances in my experience where you've had um, intermittent dropouts happen. Uh, that could be that somebody placed, um, in this case, an antenna in a radiology area where it, it brought in EMI emissions from an ultrasound machine. I've seen other instances where it happened only in certain times of the week at certain hours of the day where it turned out to be an antenna is placed outside a chapel that had a bad ballast when the fluorescent light went on. Another instance where an antenna, because the layout was placed in one floor of the hospital, but it was next to an interstitial space where you had a bad motor that was exhibiting EMI. And all that had to be, tr took time to troubleshoot down because again, the only way to properly troubleshoot that, those type of systems is to take a spectrum analyzer and, and put that on each floor, each leg of the system and separate out so you can isolate where that is. So it's a lot more time consuming in WMTS. It's, it's, it's time consuming. It's also, it takes a certain amount of skills and expertise to really understand because these are all custom systems that are custom to each facility. 
there are no enterprise tools available to allow you that, you know, unlike the wireless LAN space, that allow you to really go through and figure out from a network side or from a wireless perspective what is going on. Um, and you really have to have somebody that knows how to run, you know, a spectrum analyzer, really understand. It could be also things like somebody, when they installed this, they didn't have the right connector connected all the way, or they bent the inter uh, interconductor, the old coaxial connector, and you wouldn't necessarily know that unless you started disconnecting all these different pieces of coaxial cable. So it's very mechanical. It's, very, it's mechanical. Um, it's it's based upon you know coaxial TV, you know, CATV infrastructure that's been around for 30 years. So, from the connector side, from the interference side, where you have the antennas placed. Um, there's a lot of different factors that play into, you know, quote, mitigating any type of, quote, dropout. Dropout will occur with WMTS, it'll occur with wireless LAN. However, in, you know, my experience in designing both, it's, it's a lot less headaches, a lot less hassle factors, and a lot more reliable to design wireless LAN. Because you have the enterprise tools and the technology is advanced. You're, you're, ta you're taking advantage of billions of dollars that's being invested in this space um, that's really drove this whole revolution versus um, not the R&D or the limited R&D that's placed in WMTS. So you got all these big companies designing all the chipsets that have gone through all the different understandings of the, all the variations you, you, of what needs to be done. You have video being driven over that. You have the IEEE standards, which are driving interoperability um, and ensuring quality of service. And you got the big companies out there. I mean, this is, this is taking, this is already left the train station. It's being widely deployed in mission critical, life critical environments. I mean, all the financial transactions that are going on daily in these stock exchanges are going through a secure wireless network. And they wouldn't be doing that if it wasn't secure and then had the right quality of service. Can you expand on this by telling us about the status of Enterprise Wireless LAN today? Well, Enterprise Wireless LAN has gone through um, a lot of positive changes in the past 10 years. As I mentioned, we started out with 811B. Uh, back in 1999 being, being approved, and now we're projected to have 8011 ac by the end of maybe this year, 2014. And essentially what this has done is, uh, is provided a capability where you're probably not going to have any longer uh, wired Ethernet. And because of the mobility requirements that we have today, everybody's mobile. They want that increased mobility to increase that productivity. So we're moving out of the realm of having ad hoc wireless just being installed for limited areas. Um, like step down units. Like step down yeah. units or just in specific areas of, of a hospital. We really have to look at, we need to have every square inch of that facility covered uh, because of all those mobility requirements. So going forward um, in building a building or retrofitting a building, it just makes sense to, to have pervasive wireless line coverage because the cost to do that in is minimal versus the huge benefits that are you know, being, you know, can be uh, accrued by the, the mobility workers. And it goes back, and if you're contrasting back in the 30s and 40s when we had uh, room air conditioning, uh, those room air conditioners were usually put in areas where you know, people that needed or desired that productivity. And then because of that increased productivity, people thought, well, we probably need to have that across the entire building. And you know, today you have you know, you wouldn't think of building a building today without centralized heating, ventilation, air conditioning. And moving forward tomorrow, that's going to be the same thing with any type of wireless LAN coverage. It's going to be like a utility. Uh, wireless LAN will become, or is, the, the gold standard to improve productivity, because that's the world that we live in today. So Dave, do you recommend using the same network for monitoring both transport patients and ambulatory telemetry patients? Wireless LAN can be used for patient transport monitoring. It also could be used in a very reliable fashion for ambulatory telemetry monitoring. I think the question may go back to, you know, some companies out there use wireless LAN for transport monitoring, or some may use WMTS for telemetry monitoring. And, you know, I think what's happened now is you have a high growth of telemetry monitoring because that's where the growth is to get the patients that are from the high acute areas to subacute areas plus 
it's ambulatory monitoring, and it's a lot less costly than uh, using uh, dedicated transport monitors. While you do have to have possibly some transport monitors when you need to monitor a patient using an art line, what I find ironic is some of those companies that would advocate using wireless LAN for a higher acuity patient and transport monitoring decide to um, use WMTS for telemetry monitoring. Um, at the end of the day, uh, it's less cost to have one infrastructure, it's less risk to manage one infrastructure, uh, and yet can have quality of service uh, dedicated in both different types of acuity patients in one, in one managed wireless LAN. And you can move the patients between, if you are moving a patient from, say, an acuity, a high acuity monitor to a telemetry monitor, they'd be on the same network? Would beyond, that the beyond, the, beyond the same network, you have one design, uh, you have one infrastructure, um, one managed infrastructure, uh, and, you know, less, less type of risk. Dave, there's a lot of talk about the different bands of Wi-Fi, you know, the A, the B, the G, the whole alphabet soup. What do I need to care about? That's a... Uh, Interesting question. I mean, if we go back to, you know, wireless LAN specifically, how it e evolved, um, it didn't evolve based upon the requirements of healthcare. It evolved based upon enterprise IEEE requirements. So we started out with uh, 811B being approved in um, 1999. And the whole premise is people wanted faster, more and more bandwidth. So of course we got G ratified, both B and G are in 2.4. And then A came along you know, shortly after that in the five gig area. And now we have 811N, and then we have uh, coming out 811AC. And all these, this maturation or this evolution has been improving more and more about quality of service, mm -hmm. security, faster and faster speeds and feeds. Because that's, you know, that's the kind of game right now is that the faster speeds will allow you to displace a lot of the, the wired ethernet. So if you go back to patient monitoring, if I said earlier, patient monitoring takes a very small amount of bandwidth. Uh, and that bandwidth requirement can be set up with the quality service requirements and all the controllers. If there's been a lot of talk regarding G versus A. You know, the challenge is with, say, A at 5 gig, that has to, re has to requ require a total redesign of the wireless LAN because you have shorter distances at 5 gigahertz. So if you're looking at saying, well, I have capability of providing um, wireless LAN coverage for patient monitoring and other applications, and you have an existing wireless LAN, that requires a, a total redesign. And so you know, based upon the requirements of, the, of patient monitoring, you know, that isn't re really necessarily needed. And if you look at going forward in terms of 811 AC, all that's going to be in the 5 gigahertz area anyway. And that requirement, because of AC, uh, and that's going to allow you to provide real-time video. What's driving that is the, the, you know, the areas in such as education, video teleconferencing, so that whole area um, in the AC area, as I mentioned, is 5 gig. So if, if we look at the applications such as monitoring, that will very much e easily uh, do very well in, in a 2.4 gig area from now on. So you don't have to have a forklift upgrade of anything when you uh, continue to move forward with Wi-Fi? This is all predicated by IEEE. And IEEE standards have defined each different uh, variation or flavor of Wi-Fi that's come out. But the, the, the overarching premise is that all this has to be compatible with legacy or other older type technologies that are out there. For instance, when you know, BG came out, G had to be compatible with B. That was basically to ensure that legacy type of I interaction. So all the different security supplicants, all the different security schemas, that were present, you know, in ABG will be present in N, will be present in AC, and offer full backwards and forward compatibility. Dave, I hear that the spectrum is becoming increasingly crowded with voice, data, imaging, videos all coming onto the Wi Fi network. How do I know that patient monitoring, that a life critical application of patient monitoring is going to be, that this network is going to be reliable enough for that? 
That's a very good question because it's really, in my opinion, not so much about spectrum, but it's about managing and how you design your network. It's a matter of bandwidth based upon the requirements of the different applications. So it starts out first with you know looking at how you design the RF side. So you essentially would have a common ESSID being used for that application and the, and the access points, and then it would you know communicate back to the network, and you'd set up each application on a separate prioritization uh, VLAN. It would go back to the network and pass through the correct security supplicants and back in the controller, it would designate based upon that VLAN, this is the quality of service for this type of application. So in the case of patient monitoring, you'd have everything on a dedicated ESSID for patient monitoring, a dedicated VLAN. That VLAN would then be tagged into the controller and said, I'd have this QoS for this amount of um, prioritization, this amount of QoS for this amount a bandwidth for that application. So no matter whether it's voice, no matter whether it's video, no matter whether it's data, whatever network traffic came into that entire system as an as a ecosystem, it'll be, it's segregated by its separate VLAN, and then it's uh, QoS prioritization, prioritization in the controller by the, by the wireless line controller. That's networking you know, 101, and that's how it's done day in and day out for virtually all other types of applications across all the vertical markets in multiple industries. So basically what you're saying is that if it's designed properly, there is no problem with reliability. That's correct. I mean, it also stems from how you did your site survey and how you did your site design. Uh, a lot of site designs were not taken into account of doing um, a site analysis inside the patient room because that's they may have been done for laptops and voice down in the hallways, but in this type of instance where patient monitoring is inside the patient room, and the site needs to take into account a certain design criteria for how that application you know, needs to work. In other words, there needs to be a stronger signal strength and needs to take into account that connectivity. So from a design perspective, from a, a wireless design, that has to be looked at, and then additionally, then you look at your application requirements and you set this up as, as basically as services. There's no difference from saying if I need to have voice services, I need to make sure my voice services have that level of requirement of where there, where, wherever I have voice traffic. Can you discuss the process for determining where you need coverage? That's a, a good point. Uh, one of the earliest times or the stages of using wireless LAN was for data and that was traditionally used or used today for wireless laptops. Those laptops tend to be part of the EMR on carts and usually sit outside a patient's room. Mm -hmm. So when you look at wireless LAN coverage, the coverage that was done for site surveys was pretty much limited you know, in certain areas. Those laptops and carts were not really mobile. They were, tended to be mobile, sometimes being taken into the patient's rooms and then set outside. In terms of patient monitoring, that's a whole different application requirement. The patient's being warned, the patient warned monitor while they're in that room, so there needs to be site coverage. There needs, first of all, there needs to be an understanding from a clinician's perspective, where is that patient going to go? That patient may be in the patient room, may be ambulatory going down the hallway, so they're in a much mo more mobile environment. They may have a need to go down to the uh, radiology area to get a CT scan or go down to the cafeteria to take a break. So they'll be going down an elevator. They may be going down in radiology where there's lead line rooms. Or there may be also, say, going into the cafeteria, maybe just going outside in, in, a, in a patio type area. So that really type of patient flow, patient process, patient coverage needs to be communicated to the CIO or the IT department. So they need to work in a collaborative fashion so that when it's implemented that the design requirements, the amount of design requirements to meet the mobility requirements is there and also coverage requirements because the last, you know, this is somewhat similar to designing for voice over IP is that when you go in an elevator shaft, you don't want to lose your voice coverage. In terms of patient monitoring, you don't want to lose any coverage at all. So you need to look at that type of mission-critical design requirements to fit uh, patient monitoring.
So you have to work in collaboration with Perhaps, the clinical yeah, staff. Yeah, I mean, traditionally what's happened, you know, is, as I mentioned, you had laptops and carts. Those were outside the patient's uh, rooms. Traditionally, the IT organization independently um, did their own site surveys, either using outside mm -hmm. integrator or themselves. But now as this is moving to medical device applications, specifically patient monitoring, which is of a more real-time nature, there needs to be this collaborative understanding for the clini clinicians to really work with the IT organizations and, and say, hey, this is where my patients are gonna go. I need this coverage. And then they can communicate to their outside integrator the design requirements. Can you compare and contrast WMTS and Wi-Fi when it comes to scalability? When you look at uh, WMTS, when WMTS was initially uh, formed, that was back in the late 1990s before Wi-Fi came out. And essentially there were two spectrum areas, the 608 to 614, and the higher band at 1.4 gigahertz. And the 608 to 614, based upon the channelization of each transmitter, there is a finite number of channels, um, approximately 200, 240, sometimes less than that. So as we see how patient telemetry is expanding because people want to be more ambulatory, there are in a lot of institutions, they need to go beyond that number of channels. And so hence why you have the higher band of 1.4. So essentially you have now two different spectrums and two different infrastructures to support your growing requirements. In the case of wireless LAN or YLAN, um, for the limited amount of bandwidth that's needed for patient monitoring, there's an infinite number of channels. It's basically, as I said, unlimited, primarily because it's an enterprise application and you can support different applications simultaneously. Patient monitoring, because it uses a very small amount of bandwidth, is not going to tax that network. Um, so as the institution needs grow, you know, should have ultimate scalability. So what about the cost of uh, scaling out each with each type of network? Um, that's also interesting in the case of, um, as I mentioned earlier on, you need housewide coverage for the flexibility in monitoring your patients. So putting in a dedicated uh, coaxial type cable network can cost anywhere from a dollar up to two dollars a square foot. So that's additional infrastructure coverage. So on say a million square feet of coverage, you know, it could be a million to a million and a half. I mean, it, there's the variabilities there. In case of a wireless LAN, where you may have coverage already for all these additional applications, it may or may not be designed to voice requirements that, so that may require some additional access points or additional re remediation. But it's a lot less cost, you know, tremendous lot less cost in adding in a separate infrastructure specifically for one application. So even though you would have to add remediation to that network, it could be amortized over a period of time because you're not only using it for patient monitoring, but you're using it for voice, data, or even wireless infusion pumps as well. So what cost would you give if you said a million to a million and a half for the um, WMTS? What would the incremental cost be for Wi-Fi? Uh, that's, well, again, that's going to be difficult to say. It'd be significantly more than wireless LAN. You know, I've seen costs from, you know, approximated from a dollar twenty to two dollars a square foot. But at the end of the day, um, not be holding to, to, to a spe specific number, it significantly, um, much more significantly increased than using the existing infrastructure that you potentially already have in place. Now, you, you may have, have to add some additional APs mm -hmm. for remediation, but that small incremental cost compared to a separate dedicated infrastructure for one application. And additionally, if you add that those um, additional infrastructure or such as access points. Because you're spreading that out across these different applications, your ROI is significantly much greater. So, um, you know, the, from a financial executive sense, in my opinion, that's, you know, where the future is going. 
So I'm sure there are a lot of other things that a hospital could do with that half a million, million, million and a half dollars that they'd save by using their existing Wi-Fi infrastructure for patient monitoring. You're correct. There's a lot of pressure for meaningful use. Um, if you've done a lot of, if I've done a lot of surveys today, you'll see that infrastructure spending has been really, really slowed down because hospitals are wanting to spend that money to get their meaningful use requirements in place. That's making sure their EMR not only in their own facility, but in clinics, physicians' offices are all communicated. And there's also a huge amount of pressure for you know, medical devices to be communicated to that EMR. So that tends to be where the focus is today. So if I'm an executive and I'm looking at the pressures on me to get that done within a timetable, I'm looking at my, you know, my spending and my dollars and where I'm gonna spend it. So all of a sudden I have increased need, increased my patient telemetry usage, and I can look at saving a fair amount of money by using my existing infrastructure that I already have in place without having to use new proprietary infrastructure for one application, it makes a lot of financial sense to me to do that. Because I have to be reporting to my board and asking them, hey, I need an additional X amount of money, and they're gonna be questioning that as well. What's the difference between WMTS and Wi-Fi regarding interference? That's a really very good question because when you talk about interference, uh, that also could be classified as dropout. So if you look at the first, as you mentioned, WMTS, if we see interference or dropout that occurs normally on the central station, but we have really nowhere or no idea where that's occurring within the entire ecosystem or system that's been designed. And if you look at a traditional you know, WMTS system, that's a coaxial antenna system that's deployed on each floor in um, a situation using AB antennas or diversity type antenna systems. So those antennas are deployed down the hallways in patient rooms, they're amplified in each floor. They're connected back to two final home runs back to the receiver section. So essentially you have to go to each floor, disconnect every leg of the antenna system, connect a spectrum analyzer, and understand potentially where that interference is occurring. That could occur from all different types of sources. It occur, could occur because you have a wrong connector connected in incorrectly. It could be EMI from different sources, but essentially it's a very methodical, hands-on approach that you have to take. And in terms of the wireless LAN, is now they've advanced to a point to where they've in incorporated uh, spectrum analysis in different types of manufacturers access points. So essentially, if you had an interferer, this spectrum analyzer would identify and classify that interferer and provide notification directly and immediately to the IT administrator and log that. And additionally, because you know where that interferer is occurring or interferer is occurring, such as potentially any type of um, device, you know, that may be in that certain frequency range, you could identify and resolve that immediately. So one is taking approach where you might have to take numbers of days or weeks and somebody taking expensive pieces of equipment on site to physically have to connect and disconnect and reanalyze everything. One is more of an enterprise IT approach that automatically analyzes things 24-7, 365 proactively logs, identifies, and notifies. Dave, what are the patient safety benefits of bi-directional communication? If you start looking at telemetry communication in general, in the past it has all been unidirectional. So if you look at traditional before WMTS, UHF, VHF, now WMTS, as a patient wears a transmitter, it transmits to or through a coaxial antenna system back to the receiver to the central station. So the bigger premise here is we're, we're looking at, well, what, what's in the, in the instance of dropout, what happens? You know, in this instance, if there's a dropout, there's no notification to the caregiver on that transmitter that a dropout had occurred that only occurs at the central station, so not somebody at the point of care. And additionally, there's no acknowledgement, acknowledgement back to, to, the, to the transmitter itself. In the case of bi-directional, if we're looking at wireless LAN communication, you essentially have 
that device is a receiver and transmitter that transmits information. It would be just like your laptop. It transmits information, in this case, back to a central station. In case it goes out of range, there'll be a notification onto the transmitter that you're out of range. But more importantly, it's still monitoring the patient. That is a full-fledged patient monitor that's monitoring the patient with the EKG and vital signs. In the case of WMTS, that monitoring has essentially stopped. So in terms of risk to that patient, uh, there's probably more risk uh, monitoring the patient on WMTS if a, a quote dropout occurred. If any type of dropout occurred on a monitoring system using wireless LAN, you'd have that notification back to the caregiver, but you're also still monitoring that patient. Locally. Locally. You still have the alarms, you still have the alerts, you still have the waveform on the display. So there's, there's no compromise to patient safety from that aspect. So if a hospital were to implement patient monitoring on its existing Wi-Fi networks, what would be the best practices for it to follow? Yeah, the assumption is and the understanding is there are certain patient monitoring requirements in terms of how it has to operate on the network, and that's defined by that company. And then there's also needs in terms of clinical workflow and processes where that patient has to go. So there's a technical requirement that's required of how that application needs to be, to be performing. And there's also a need of where that application needs to be performing at that technical requirement. So my assumption would be is that I would approach this as a greenfield opportunity, meaning I'm starting from scratch because I'm not quite sure how the IT organization, or in this instance, a lot of times the IT organization outsources that to outside integrators. The first step I would ask for is the CAD drawings or the drawings of the facility. I would have the clinician or the clinical team outline where they'd want to have coverage for that patient, I meaning all, all the rooms, all the hallways, all the elevators, where that patient would travel, the radiology, the cardiology, cath lab, cafeteria, anywhere that patient would go. Then based upon that, I would use a predictive model that could take into account. I'd also get on the phone with the facilities and understand the age of construction of facility, to understand the wall compositions, the tile, the types of rooms, where they'd have the bathrooms located, any isolation rooms, any lead line rooms and radiology. And I could take that understanding after conversations and discussions and build a, a, a predictive model of that facility. So I would take the technical requirements of the application for in this instance patient monitoring because I know the technical requirements of the transmitter monitor. I would also know the technical requirements of the existing infrastructure manufacturer because I had those characteristics of the access points and controllers. So based upon the infrastructure requirements of the known entities, transmitter and infrastructure and the envi environmental factors of the materials, I could build a model that's probably within 96% accurate. Uh, then I could turn back to the organization and say, all right, here's what you need to meet your clinical requirements based upon where the patient's going to travel. Here's technically the requirements. Then they could go back to their integrator or whoever they use and say, based upon our existing architecture that we have, we need to add or remediate this amount to meet these requirements. And so that's you know, essentially a stepwise process on what needs to be done. And that would be the same thing that would be done if I do a voice application as well, because voice has a certain requirements. It'd be essentially saying, hey, you know, if I need a voice over IP phone, I'm not, I'm not gonna be stationary with that phone. I'm gonna be a caregiver, and I'm going down the hallway, I'm going down through the elevators, I'm going all over the facility. It's kind of the same workflow and environment as patient monitoring. So if you already have a VOIP and it's working, is there much more work to do it to bring on patient monitoring? Um, in my estimation, yes, there is, because you don't really know if that site analysis or design was designed for the requirements of, of say, patient monitoring. It could be that the voice over IP phone, they did the site analysis where it's usually used 90% outside the patient room and down the hallways. And it may, that voice over IP phone may have been only used on one floor, may have been isolated to one floor in a care area, Occasionally, you might have walked inside or gone inside a patient room. 
in the case of a patient monitoring, that's worn on a patient. Normally that patient's in the bed. And that bed, then from that patient's bedside, that signal has to get through, in this case, maybe a bathroom um, down to an access point down the hallway. The patient may walk and be ambulatory because if they're wearing telemetry, they're normally ambulatory. That patient may be accompanied by a caregiver to go into an elevator, may go down to get a CT scan, uh, which in radiology there's a lot of lead line rooms. So from a voice over IP requirement, more than likely you may not have that nurse that's a critical care nurse traversing the entire facility. In the case of patient telemetry, that's becoming more of the common use model. Now what would you say the time frame would be, a typical time frame for this whole process? Uh, from, from a design standpoint in terms of um, getting all the requirements, doing the design and understanding the facility's requirements, it's not more than maybe a week. It's very quick. Wow. And then, uh, but, but it's a matter of just organizing you know, in, and, uh, and getting the proper people in place. Again, it's understanding from a, get, you need a team of people, you need the clinical people <laughs> together to really detail out where the patient is going to be moving, the patient flow. And, and actually, I'd like to have them sign off on, that do, on those mm -hmm, documents mm -hmm. to, you know, to really indicate this is exactly where we're going to go so that you have um, their signature, th you know, signature authority or approval or whatever so there's no mystifying mistakes if that's not where things need to go. And then you have to get the facilities plans and you have to get those current plans, not old plans, and then do that you know, modeling and you have to then get on the phone with the facilities and them to describe to you, you may have to go there on site. But a lot of the design that was done in the past was I called a walk around site survey, which is a, uh, I shouldn't say waste, but not the new way of doing things. It's if you really can get the appropriate resources on the phone, talk to them, understand the requirements, it can really shorten this time cycle, but also, also can lessen a lot of the costs. Because a lot of the costs were usually by sending somebody on site to walk around to do an in-site survey, which in you know, a large, large amount of cases you don't have to do anymore. Dave, this has been a lot of information, a lot of good information. Thank you very, very much. So I'd like to uh, summarize what I heard you say today. And one is that Wi-Fi is safe and reliable for patient monitoring. Two, that the key for success is in the design and implementation and management of the network. And three, that Wi-Fi opens the door to unprecedented benefits for the hospital, including the ability to monitor a virtually unlimited number of patients housewide, significant cost savings, improved workflow, and a lot of other benefits. Now, let's say somebody is listening to this webinar today and they go away and think about it three days later. What would you like to stick in their minds from what you've said today? I, hopefully this has been a good educational experience for everybody. I, I think if I want someone to uh, stay with me is understanding that that w the wireless LAN marketplace, wireless LAN in general, is where it is today and it's the future and it's safe, it's reliable. There is billions of dollars being spent in this industry and that is where the market is going. And we can be confident that patient monitoring and other medical applications will work in a reliable fashion. To your point, it's about design and implementation, but those best practices and design and implementation have been vetted out in tens if not hundreds of thousands of different implementations around the world. The WMTS market, while when it came out, was needed to come out. Um, but it's been surpassed. It's been surpassed by the quality, design, and the many firms that are in this space designing and implementing wireless lands in all these different marketplaces. Well, our time is up. Dave, thank you so very much for all of your efforts today. Great job, great answers as usual. Thank you very thank much, you. Kathy.